on what men have called the prodigal son. We might call it the story of the lost boy, Luke 15, 11 through 32. I think I have 33. But since that is all there in the Bible, and Luke 33, or rather 33 is not, if you can find 33, I want you to read it. So that's one of my mistypes. So Luke 15, 11 through 32. As I say, men have called this the story of the prodigal son. But before we get into this, I want you to notice that Jesus told three stories in the 15th chapter of Luke. He told about the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost boy. To understand the full message, you have to know that he's talking about as you take the gospel to the world, you're going to find three classes of people. Sheep can know it's lost. It doesn't know a thing in the world how to come back from where it is. It's just lost. But it's aware of its being lost. The lost coin, an animal object, has no knowledge of anything. It's just lost. Someone has to go out there and find it. It doesn't know its own worth. But the lost boy can know he's lost and he can know what to do about certain things as Jesus sets it out here in the scriptures. We in the church are striving to know more about Jesus and need to understand Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. All men who are accountable to God have sinned, Romans 3.23, and the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. They all fall in one of these categories. You must realize also that Jesus is speaking under the law of Moses, speaking as a Jew to Jews. And that makes a difference as to their understanding of the situation with this young man. So I would like to look for a while at the story of the prodigal son. And I'd like for us to understand that there is a valuable application for each of us in this. First of all, Let's note this point, and that is desire, lust, led this young man astray. This younger son, for he had an older brother, was no longer content with his father's home. Does that possibly sound familiar with a lot of things nowadays, and in fact in every generation? So when we look at desire, we can see that he was dissatisfied. I think there are people that are dissatisfied with their homes, with what they call home. Sometimes in the best of homes, people can be dissatisfied. He no longer treasured his father's love, his father's care, his father's protection, his father's training and whatever he provided for him in the home. He didn't want his guidance, his counsel, or his association. And they, in effect, were contemptuously thrown aside. It just comes down to this, and it's always been the problem. He wanted to have his own way. He longed for the far country. Because man so often falls into this grievous error, then God warns us, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride or vainglory of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. This young man did not have that disposition of mind toward things. One who enjoys the Father's association and does his will. Now mark that. One who enjoys. We can put before that one who seeks the Father's fellowship or association. One who enjoys it. One who keeps his commandments is never going to depart from him. When you do those things, you can't depart from him. You're going the opposite direction from departing. You're drawing near him. 
God does not turn from man. Man has always turned from God. God has always extended to man His mercy, His kindness, His desire for all men to be saved. But it must be on God's terms, and there is the problem. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. Now remember, sin is the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, verse 4. It brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. James 1, 14 and 15. So how we are to guard against evil desires, how we must guard our minds, how we must fill our minds with the truth, how we must examine ourselves, to see whether we want to draw nigh to God. Are we willing to do things on His own terms as they're set out in the Scriptures? Our next point, also beginning with the D, as all of these points will be, is from verse 12. He demanded, He demanded that portion of His Father's goods. And that was an unreasonable thing for Him to do and a very foolish thing for Him to do. He really had no right to anything his father owned. He enjoyed the fruits of his father's labors. Why? Solely because his father willingly shared with him. Because his father had a duty to him. His father loved him. He was his son. His father owned these things and could hold them until he died. Then it would be will to his two sons. But he doesn't want to wait. Does that sound like people today? So he stubbornly, a young boy stubbornly demands his share. And notice, right now, does that sound like young people? That's about the way it is sometimes when we deal with God. It must be right now. It must be right now. In Brother Jeff's study in the auditorium class on Sunday morning, very rich study of the book of Job, one of the things he's pointed out and is becoming clearer and clearer to those of us in the class, if you've never studied Job, is that Job doesn't understand why all this is happening to him. And he wants an answer. It's in us to be, well, we want things yesterday. We ever use that terminology? When do you need it? Yesterday. So uh, God says that's not the way it works. Now you can say, well, yeah, but I, why doesn't it work that way? Now you're back with Job. <laughs> See, complete trust in God based on His Word, Romans 10, 17, means we wait on God. You know that uh, old mo uh, television program back in the 50s, Father Knows Best? Well, when you apply that to your Heavenly Father, you may not understand, but Father Knows Best. But due to His urgent appeal... His father, in this case, granted his young son's request. But have you noticed it was not really in the best interest of the son in view of the son's attitude? Well, God has often allowed people to have what they demand. I think one of the greatest examples of that is when you study the history of the Israelites. He let them have a king. He even provided for guidance of the law of Moses for a king when they got one. But he made it clear that they were rejecting him as king. And they wanted a king to be like the nations round about them. Notice what the psalmist said in Psalm 106, beginning verse 3. They soon forgot his works. They waited not for his counsel but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. And he gave them their request, but sent leanness under their souls. They got what they wanted. They got what they asked for, but it wasn't good for them. Now, if they were capable of being taught anything, they would have learned from the school of hard knocks. But when you read of the Israelites and their wanderings and their continual sins, they didn't learn too well. God sent leanness to their souls. 
That brings us now into verse 13 also. And we look at the word departure. He departed into a far country. He went to a place where he could just do as he pleased, and maybe the idea is it won't get back to daddy. He's free of his father's influence, of his guidance. He's now his own man to do his own thing. Well, he had his own way. His father gave him what he wanted. So you see, he can now make his own life. But not under the guidance of his father. Notice his father had divided his living uh, among them. Uh, nothing was selfishly withheld from his son. He gave to his sons all he had. Now, I stop and think for a minute. Does that sound like our Heavenly Father? Doesn't he pour out all sorts of things upon us? You think of uh, just the familiar passage of John 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He's the author of every good and perfect gift. Notice, too, what he said in Matthew 5, 45. For he maketh his Son to shine on the evil and the good. And sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. So none can deny our Father, our Heavenly Father's care for us. Now we look further at uh, the young man. And we see the word dissipation in verse 13. Or at least it comes from the sentiments of verse 13. Dissipation followed close on the heels of his newfound treasures. By the way for which he had not really labored. Surely, as I said in the beginning, since this fit that culture in those Jews and the situation of the time, that audience to whom Jesus told this story must have, uh, at least some of them, winced at the thought of a Jewish boy wasting his substance among foreigners, among Gentiles. But home ties and the father's love had been traded away, had been bartered for this kind of life. Wasteful, riotous living soon depletes any fortune. Yet how much more wasteful are we when we squander God-given time, energies, talents in the service of the devil? How do we serve the devil? Well, you say you sin. What's sin? It's breaking God's law. Why do we break God's law? We like to do what we like to do. And when it conflicts with God's law, we still do what we like to do. It's sad to think of a wasted life. That used to be in an old song. I haven't seen it around a long time, but it was used as in a song people sing, a wasted life. But we often waste hours in serving our worst enemy. In other words, the far country of sin offers revelry, it offers good times, but the pleasures of sin, as is plainly taught in Hebrews, only last for a season. And they can usher in lifelong regrets, and indeed, dying unforgiven eternal regrets. Such pleasures are never satisfying or lasting. And any life away from God can bring only heartaches and pain. Our world has never learned that. I don't think it ever will. Only a few people will pay attention to the truth of God. Most of the world will continue to try to run its own affairs. They can't even see from world history how that's fared. And it's never fared well for humankind. But we're led now to verse 14 and the word destitute. Destitution surely follows dissipation. And famine oft follows a life of plenty. The young man had now squandered all. And there's real need, true need, confronting him. All of his uh, so-called fair-weathered friends had forsaken him. And he is truly in dire want. Well, now the question comes to him. Where am I going to go? To whom will I turn? Well, surely not to those responsible for his plight. 
You know, he knew that. Just read the account here. He knew I can't turn to these people. An alcoholic who's willing to admit I am an alcoholic doesn't turn to folks who won't admit they're alcoholics but are and continue to drink to receive the proper help. Think about it for a moment. You don't want to expose yourself if you have a problem to that which encourages the problem. Evil companionship corrupts good morals. Yeah, but I think I can... No, it doesn't make a difference. Evil companionship corrupts good morals. Yeah, but I think I... Evil companionships corrupt good morals. Well, just a little... I want... Evil companionships corrupt good morals. Alcohol has made millions of alcoholics. It's done more hurt than you can ever begin to realize before a person ever even gets to be what is determined an alcoholic it causes all sorts of trouble the devil's exchange counter never offers equal value you cannot deal with him on reasonable terms so this young man could at least recall the situation back at home remember what he'd been taught remember how things were done remember his father so he knew he had to turn elsewhere for help rather than those that were with him as fair weather friends. Not to those who had ruined his life, in other words. And so the sinner must come to grips with the fact that I need God. I can't make it on my own. I'm in the mess I'm in because that's what I chose to do. My will has brought me here. The seeking to gratify the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, pride of life. That's the reason I'm in the mess I'm in. I chose to go that way. The appetites of the flesh are more important to me than the commandments of God. And so here's where I am. So I need to know where I can go to get real help, to get real aid, to get real comfort and assistance. And of course, that means the Heavenly Father and His plan in the divine volume, the Bible. Now let's go further with the young man. We come to degradation in verse 16. And this follows destitution. And the young man is sunk now to a very pitiful, shameful life. He not only is forced into the employ of heathen people, but he was sent to take care of hogs. And he's so hungry, he eats what they ate. There's no way today that we can possibly understand the impact, the jarring impact this will have upon the Jewish mind of that time feeding the unclean beast for heathen master but in this degradation he's caused to go that low well he's eating out of the trough of the hogs now why is he where he is was it his father's fault was it anybody's fault but his own until he comes to that view, until he comes to grips with himself and looks in the mirror and sees that reflection and says, buddy, right there is the reason I'm where I am. He's going to stay in the hog trough or worse. But our Lord's interested in teaching in these three accounts of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost boy of showing there are those who know they're in a mess and they're there because they put themselves there by their own will to turn against God and satisfy the appetites of the flesh. They know where to turn to to get relief, to get assistance. And he's interested in mercy. He's interested in mercy. I see people all my life of preaching and even as a teenager, remember some in the church where I grew up. who appeared to be somewhat, and maybe they were for a while, I wouldn't deny that. But over a period of time, due to circumstances, then they fell away. They went back to the world, they gave up Christianity. I haven't worked in a church or known other preachers in other churches who can't say the same thing about their background and their work. The call of the world, the appetites of the flesh becomes too great for people. But how does God see folks like this? Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 and 22. 
For it had been better if they had not known the way of righteousness than after they've known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it's happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog has turned to his own vomit again. You know, I, I, I think probably all of us have seen that happen, actually. There's nothing more repulsive than that. And the sow that was washed her wallowing in the mire. It has been aptly said, if you don't want to be classed with hogs, don't wallow with them in the mire. You can't serve God while playing with the world. When we lived in Tulsa, the congregation, the Northside congregation, was a biracial congregation. And one of the preachers there, an elderly brother, black man, had preached for years. And he was preaching one day, and I remember him to telling this story about a young woman who just kept coming to him. She would sin and come back and say, I'm sorry. She would sin and come back and say, I'm sorry. But she'd go back and commit the same sins. Sin of fornication over and over again. Finally, he told her, he said, why don't you just go and stay in the world and keep on doing that kind of thing until you get it burnt out of you and it's not going to ever haunt you again. And then you'll know what repentance is and you'll turn from the ways of the world and throw yourself on the mercy of God by living according to the truth. He told that in the pulpit, and I've remembered that. There's a lot of people that haven't got down to eating with the hogs yet. But they're headed that way. I don't know whether some of them will learn as this young prodigal did, but some have to go down that low. Their will is just that way. I, it's not father knows best. It's my will knows best. And yet they can't look around and see they're going down, down, down in the misery. Sin has a way of deceiving us. The devil lies. A lie is contrary to the truth. He's the father of lies. He's not going to tell you the truth. He'll let you believe a certain amount of truth if it'll suit his purposes, but he's not going to tell you the whole truth and nothing but the truth. He'll use it to get you away from God. There's a multiplicity of people in the denominational world. They all believe in God, Christ, the Bible. They believe that there's a need for forgiveness of sins, yet they do not follow the doctrine of Christ. I'm sure that satisfies the devil just fine. If he can keep you away as a person outside of Christ from believing you have to be baptized by the authority of Christ for the remission of sins, having first believed in Christ, repented of your sins, and confessed your faith in Him. He's happy to have you believe in Christ. Well, even the demons believe and tremble, don't they? He's happy to have you tremble. Just as long as you don't from the heart obey the form of doctrine. He's glad to have you in this worship assembly this morning. But what do you do outside of it? What are you doing with your life? You can bring that down to families. You can bring it down to your employers, wherever you work, your students. Because you can be here and you can say, yes, what he's preaching is the truth because I can read it in my own Bible. But really, what are your goals? Are you working toward those goals? Are they, are they goals that God has set? Or are they just with this world, with this particular way? But let's end on a positive note. This young man turned and said, I'll go back to my father's house. He had examined himself to see what was what, and he did it honestly and objectively as we're taught, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. And he came to the right conclusion. I, I'll just say, just accept me as one of the hired servants. Now he's humble. Now you can do something with him. You couldn't before. Why didn't he have that attitude before he ever said, I want it and I want it now, Daddy. I want to go to a far country. Look at the misery he would have saved himself. But that's what happens when self-will works. And it's happened with everybody, one extent or the other. It's just that God gives us sense enough after you've heard the gospel to know not to go that far. But even when you do, here's an example, you can turn around and come back. You can truly repent of your sins. And there have been those who've obeyed the gospel and lived for a while, as Luke 8 teaches, but the affairs of this world begin to pull them back in. Next thing you know, they're not what they ought to be. 
Brethren sometimes would help themselves. They'd say, now right now as I'm living for the Lord, how involved in the work of Christ am I compared to, or maybe it's contrast to, the way I was a year or two, five years ago? Are you further away or are you closer? Surely we recognize there is always the need to continue to grow in the knowledge of the Word of God and in obedience and mercy and extending mercy to others if they'll receive it. But you know, there's nothing that father could have done to this young man when he had his mind set to get what he thought was his and go. Not a thing more you could do with him. And you don't see the father saying, no, wait, son. But the father's waiting when the son comes back. And he's glad to receive him. He rejoices. Now that tells me that's exactly what's going on right now with God. And that's why that you have Jesus saying, Come unto me all you that labor and are heavy laden. But you have to know that you are burdened. You have to know that it's your fault you're burdened. It's the burden of sin. It's the guilt of sin. There's but one way you can get rid of it. Humble obedience to the truth. Well, as we close the lesson, I would say, don't be like this young man when we started out with him. But be like this young man when we see him at the end. Humble and meek, not trying to say, I want my way, I want it this way, and nothing else will do. No, he had reached the stage where he was saying, Father, forgive me. I'll take whatever you, you give me. I don't deserve anything. Now that makes the difference. And until you can get somebody in the efforts to reach them with the gospel, to come to that conclusion in their own life, they're really not ready to obey the gospel. Paul in writing, and we'll end with this scripture, to the Romans to remind them what they did in becoming Christians. In Romans 6, 17, and 18 said, But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. The idea there of servants is literally is a slave. You chose to shackle yourself to Jesus because he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by him. John 14, 6. Whatever it is that Jesus puts on your shoulders as to the work in the kingdom, it's for your good. It's for your own spiritual well-being. And that attitude must prevail for all of us at all times. And if you see it slipping then that's when you start doing the correcting you need to in your own life. Because God has not changed. He still wants the humble person to receive with meekness the engrafted word. That will never change, no matter how much Bible you know and how much closer to God you are in every way. It will still be that attitude toward God and His word. I'm not worthy is a tremendous mark of a person ready to come to God. If you need to obey the gospel or return to your Lord, then we offer you this invitation song to encourage you in obedience to Christ. Would you come then while we stand and sing?